Welcome to God and Country Biblical Exposition. On this week's program, I'd like to talk about something that's way more offensive than politics. People often say don't talk politics and religion because it offends. Why is that true? Well, because politics and religion address our most deeply held beliefs and values. And that's really the big conflict going on in the world. Which God is the true God? And out of fear and denial, people often avoid these subjects and resort to superficial conversations. In this spiritual conflict in the world, people live in denial. People want to suppress the truth. They want to live in their own echo chamber. But if talking politics can be offensive, how much more offensive is true biblical doctrine? I was recently talking with an unbeliever who was offended by evangelical Christians supporting Trump. And rather than letting him lead me down that road, I said, if you think politics is offensive, that's nothing compared to the doctrine of hell. Presidents can come and go. Policies can change. You can disagree with a man's politics. And in the grand scheme of things, it makes little difference. But hell is personal and it's eternal. You can make many mistakes in life. You know, who to vote for, what career to pursue, what house to buy. But the one mistake you don't want to make is in regard to your eternal destiny. And the real fight in this world is not between Republicans and Democrats. It's between man and God. Mankind's fight against the holy God. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 12. For our transgressions are multiplied before you. And our sins testify against us, for our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord, and turning away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving in, and uttering from the heart lying words. And the sinner denies the Lord and turns away from God. Also, Romans chapter 3, verse 17, the path of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So as a side note here, don't let unbelievers sidetrack you with politics and irrelevant issues. Get to the main point. Listen, if you're offended by certain political positions, that is nothing compared to being offended by a God of holiness and truth and justice. But that's what we need to do business with God over. And that's what I'd like to discuss on today's program a short primer on the doctrine of hell. It's been a while since I've discussed a major fundamental biblical doctrine, but doctrine is crucial because all of the news events in our day are superfluous if we first don't know biblical doctrine. We cannot discern the news or even apply the news if we don't have doctrine. Therefore, a new believer should first immerse himself in all of the biblical doctrines of God the doctrines of Christ and salvation, the doctrines of last days, soteriology, angiology, eschatology. That's foundational. We can't grow in Christ without doctrinal truth. And since this is God and country, let me introduce the subject of the afterlife with some political references on this. Right before Christmas, during the week that the House passed the bill impeaching the president, Donald Trump did a rally in Michigan. And Trump commented on the House's testimony against him, particularly the testimony coming from Debbie Dingell, the Democratic Congresswoman from Michigan. Her husband, John Dingell, held the record for the longest ever serving member of Congress, 59 years. He died in February of 2019, and his wife, Debbie, took his congressional seat. So Trump says at the rally, you know Dingell, you've heard of her, Michigan, Uh, Debbie Dingell, that's a real beaut. Trump then explained how he lowered the flags to honor her husband, John Dingell, and how Debbie Dingell called him to thank him. She called me up, it's the nicest thing that ever happened, thank you so much. John would be so thrilled, he's looking down, he'd be so thrilled. 
Thank you so much, sir. I said, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, maybe he's looking up. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. But let's assume he's looking down. Then Trump went on to explain how after she supported him on the phone, she turned around and stabbed him in the back by claiming on the House floor that he violated the Constitution of the United States. And Trump said, I cannot be happy with that because I love my country. Also, Trump wrote in a tweet, last time I spoke to Debbie Dingell was her call thanking me for granting top memorial and funeral service honors for her then just departed husband, longtime Congressman John Dingell. Now I watch her ripping me as part of the Democrat impeachment hoax. Really pathetic. So apparently... Donald Trump doesn't put up with the superficial, hypocritical platitudes in Washington. So, of course, the media takes offense that Trump joked that John may be looking up, not looking down from heaven. And Debbie Dingell responds in the tweet, Mr. President, let's set politics aside. My husband earned all of his accolades after a lifetime of service. I'm preparing for the first holiday season without the man I love. You brought me down in a way you can never imagine. Your hurtful words just made my healing much harder. In an opinion piece in the Washington Post, quote, to be fair, Trump first suggested that Dingell was looking down from heaven, but the president couldn't resist a little joke. The criticism and blowback against Donald Trump for his comment on the fate of someone's eternal soul would be more meaningful if the same empathy was recorded, accorded the president when it is predicted that he will burn in hell. Such insinuations are regularly made and similar hopes expressed in emails I receive. There is even fine art prints of Trump arriving in hell available online for $30 unframed. But widespread disgust over such an affront to our president has yet to be observed. Despite the Bible's observation that the path to heaven is narrow and few will travel in it, while the road to hell is wide and much more populated, it's still improper in polite society to suggest that anyone will end up in the wrong place except when discussing Donald Trump, unquote, Washington Post, Gary Abernathy. So Trump made a little joke. That's Trump. He's a showman. He's all Hollywood. That's his shtick. But where do these Democrats and Republicans go when they die? Up or down? Sounds like the uh, beginning of a joke. Here's an old political joke. A politician dies. Instead of going to heaven or hell, an angel appears to him. And the angel tells this politician, uh, rather than being judged for his sins, he gets to choose whether he will go to heaven or hell. The politician replies that, of course, he wants to go to heaven, but the angel says, no, uh, before you really choose, you have to visit both places and give each place a fair chance. So he's first taken to heaven, and heaven looks pretty nice. Big fluffy clouds, angels are playing their harps. Everyone seems to be enjoying themselves. The politician is pleased, but it's a little underwhelming. Hell, on the other hand, is magnificent. It's the most beautiful place, beautiful gardens, swimming pools, huge buffet table. And it makes heaven look dull and boring by comparison. So the politician says, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think I'd rather go to hell. Very well, says the angel, turn around. The politician turns around and he sees that hell is a much different place. There's fire, there's brimstone, there, there's agony, there's, there's suffering, there's screams. And the politician says, I don't understand. This is not what you showed me beforehand. The angel says, well, that was the campaign. Now you vote it. And the moral of the story is that politicians will promise heaven in the campaign, but in practice, it's not so much. And also in reality, hell has a department of propaganda. Uh, Satan wants people to believe voting for him will mean a future in paradise. I have some reservations about making jokes about hell because that's what hell has become. It's just a joke. 
it's become a, a byword used for emphasis. You know, what the hell this, what the hell that. But, but hell is such a serious destiny that it should never be taken lightly. Every day, thousands of people are leaving this planet. I think the statistic is 150,000 people die every day, off into eternity. In October, Elijah Cummings, Baltimore Democrat congressman, died in office, age 68, complications due to cancer. Also in October, John Conyers, congressman from Michigan, he died at age 90. He had to step down in 2017 because of sexual allegations. And John Lewis, Democrat congressman from Georgia, has just been diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, and the survival rate is only 1%. Doesn't look good for John Lewis. Every year, three or four congressmen die in office with 535 congressmen, most of whom are elderly. That is not to be unexpected. But the death rate of congressmen who leave office is still 100%. Every soul must meet his maker. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, Inasmuch as it's appointed for men once to die, and after this the judgment. You can disbelieve biblical prophecy all you want. But there is one prophecy you cannot refute or deny, and it's a prophecy that someday you're going to die. And where will you go? Here's an article a listener sent to me. If you're a Democrat, you're probably not saved. Well, you know, that sounds pretty offensive to most people. But the article makes some good points. I mean, let's not kid ourselves as if everyone goes to heaven. The moral positions we take in this life will determine our eternal destiny. Romans chapter 2, verse 6, God will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. Well, the excerpt from this article is kind of long, but it's good, it's worth the read. Quote, I'm getting really sick of this push for unity in the church among people across the entire political spectrum. The argument is really tiring. I get it. The vast majority of people on both sides of the political equation are lost. In fact, many have grabbed on to conservative politics as a sort of moral therapeutic deism, and it's become their religion. But I'm going to argue that if you're a Democrat and you claim to be a Christian, then you don't understand the gospel at all. The argument goes, God isn't a Democrat or Republican, so it doesn't really matter. Well, quite quite frankly, that's just stupid. No Christian in their right mind would argue that God is a politician, but God does have a moral law, and he expects Christians to uphold it, and the Democratic Party is opposed to it. The Democratic Party, at its core, is radically opposed to the standards of morality set forth in Scripture whether it be the continual expansion of the slaughter of innocent children in the womb or the clamor for the promotion of homosexuality and other forms of sexual perversions. Jesus did not die for these things. He died because of these things to free us from them. Let's be clear. Your political positions, activism, or support have no bearing on your salvation, zero. However, if you claim to be a Christian, transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and brought bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, the scripture says that you'll be given a new heart and you'll be sanctified unto good works. So let me spell this out for you. This means you cannot be a Christian while supporting the slaughter of innocent children, gay rights, gay propaganda, gay Christianity, etc., etc., or the endless sweeping away of our rights to worship God freely. If you support this godless ideology or support candidates that do, Don't expect me to treat you as a fellow Christian. Don't get me wrong. I'm not shilling for the Republican Party. I realize that the Republican Party is corrupt, inside and out. However, there is not an official push, at least not right now, in the Republican Party to stand against and oppose every single one of God's moral laws. Conservatism doesn't save. Only Jesus Christ saves. But if you understand the gospel, then you cannot deny that the gospel produces conservatism 
as its fruit. So this comes from Jeff Maples in ReformationCharlotte.org. And he has a good point. Our moral choices determine whether we will be saved from hell or go to hell. And it's no small thing to be a cheerleader for murder, infanticide, immorality. I hope we haven't forgotten that. Uh, the Bible concludes in Revelation 21.8 that murderers and immoral people will be in the lake of fire, which is the second death. Uh, this week I heard one commentator point out that Soleimani is in hell with his friends. And he is, because he murdered innocent people in the name of his false worldview. He's no different than Himmler, uh, the leading SS officer under Hitler, the architect of the Jewish Holocaust. You know, the left is, is having a really hard time making any moral judgments against Soleimani. Because they don't believe in sin or judgment. They're materialists. They don't believe in a moral standard or in a moral judgment because they don't believe in a moral lawgiver, God. But in order to be of the truth, one must believe that evil is evil. Satan wants us to second guess this. Satan wants us to become truth doubting relativists. Well, expect the doctrine of sin and hell to be offensive to the sinner. But it is actually a good and a right offense because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And no one is ever saved until he first recognizes the justice of God against his sin. Every genuine Christian will say, I deserve hell. I deserved separation from God for all eternity. Every genuine unbeliever will say, I may have done bad things, but I don't deserve hell. That would be unjust of God. I was never really that bad. The true Christian understands the depth of his evil and sin. And those who come to Christ believe in hell. Those who don't come to Christ don't believe in hell. And I find that the reason most people deny hell is not on the basis of evidence or authority or objectivity. Most people decide what they believe based upon what they like or what they don't like. They believe that what they like must be true and what they don't like must be wrong. Now, sometimes on that basis, they get it right. But that is one of the most dangerous ways to determine what is truth making your feelings your standard. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there's a way which seems right unto a man, but the end is the way of death. Or in the words of C.S. Lewis, Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. So let me conclude with some doctrinal points about hell. Of course, all I can give you here is a quick overview, just some of my immediate observations. My first point is that nobody has to prove that hell is real. It's one of those biblical doctrines that are undeniable. No critic, no philosopher, no scholar has ever been able to disprove or discredit the doctrine of hell. It is proven by natural revelation. We don't even need written revelation from God. What do I mean? Well, everyone knows that in a few years, they will be dead. They will rot and the worms will eat their corpse. You say, well, that's not the doctrine of hell, the doctrine of eternal torment and fire. That's close enough for me. From an earthly perspective, that's me in the grave and I'm slowly perishing. Everyone knows that they are going to come to a very bad end. There is no evidence that we will live someday in paradise with God, but God has given us plenty of evidence that we're going to perish. It takes faith and it takes God's revelation to believe in heaven. It takes no faith and no revelation to believe in hell. 
there are graveyards all over this world that prove that when you die, you go down. Now, the devil says, are you going to believe me that there's no hell? Or are you going to believe your lying eyes? Now, somebody may console himself into thinking that, well, when they're dead, that's it. No more consciousness. So you have nothing to worry about. But you're still dead. You still have no more joy, no more purpose, no more friends, no more love, no more family for all eternity. You're no longer part of what is happening. And that sounds like hell to me. Claiming you will be unconscious is no consolation. There are liberal theologians that try to make a kinder and gentler hell by claiming that hell will just be the annihilation of the wicked, ceasing to exist. Well, that's not much of a comfort. If you're satisfied with ceasing to exist, you are a sad, sad individual. Ceasing to exist in any meaningful form is hell. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that hell is eternal. But we should always make the point with unbelievers that no matter what you may claim, you're going to lose in the end. And the end looks really, really bad. This brings me to my second point. The Bible does describe hell as eternal. As I mentioned, liberal theologians and a few evangelical theologians who have left the ranch claim that when the Bible speaks about the wicked perishing, it means ultimate destruction. That eventually the wicked will be no more. They'll be destroyed for all eternity. They will be forgotten by God because they will not exist. And this is all based upon doing academic word studies on the meaning of the word perishing or the word destruction, along with trying to make a kinder and gentler hell. But such academic, linguistic gymnastics cannot overlook the fact that the Bible defines hell as being an eternal dwelling place. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, And the devil who deceives them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And also Revelation 20, 15, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Not just the devil, the beast, and the false prophet. Revelation 14, 11, And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. And then Jesus' words in Mark chapter 9, in reference to hell, Jesus says three times about people being cast into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Note, the worm does not die. You know, I find it a waste of time to argue with these religious sophists who deny the eternality of hell because it's not as if there are unsaved people who once they discover that hell is not eternal will turn around and say, oh, well, now I'm going to believe the gospel and live for God because now I think God is being more fair. You know, those people don't exist. The reason people do not come to Christ has very little to do with the doctrine of hell. Hell is hell, no matter how you want to describe it. And we're better off staying with the obvious biblical description of hell. My third point is the justice of hell. And here's where people have their objections. People will say, how could a loving God send people to hell? Or how could people suffer for all eternity for sins committed in a finite lifespan? Well, the biblical answers to those questions are quite easy. God's love and wrath are not two attributes of God in contradiction. Because God is love, he has wrath against sin. He has wrath against those who want to destroy the object of his love. 
And so love and wrath and justice are all one attribute. And the reason people suffer in hell for all eternity is because it's not how much time they have been given to do evil. It's about their character, the condition and the disposition of their soul. At the end of this earthly life, your character is permanently set in concrete. The time for change has ended. And so we have this prophecy in Revelation 22, 11. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. And the one who is filthy still be filthy. And let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. And the one who is holy still keep himself holy. You know, that text confuses many readers. But it's simply stating that in the end, one's character is fixed. And the reason hell is rejected by most people is not because they can't believe in a place called hell. It's because they don't believe and understand the nature of sin and sinners, even their own sin. People reject hell because they believe no one deserves to be there. It's not a disbelief in the doctrine of last things. It's a disbelief in the doctrine of man and sin. At a recent recent, uh, congressional confirmation hearing, Bernie Sanders asked the nominee, Russell Vaught, a Christian, do you think that people who are not Christians are condemned? And Sanders repeatedly asked this question, saying that such a belief that Christians like Russell Vaught hold to is Islamophobic. And this point is being made constantly by the unsaved world. How can so many sincere, good, honest, religious people end up in hell? Well, the false assumption here is the goodness of man. People fail to believe that at the core of every human soul is pure evil. We are pure evil. We have a corrupt nature. Man is naturally the enemy of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seek for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. On my Christmas list this year was the book Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. And since I was on Santa's nice list this year, uh, it actually came rather than getting my usual piece of coal. But this book is about the crisis in rural America, economic and social, and he makes some great points. But even after writing about all the dysfunction in his community, he cannot admit that people are evil. Quote from his introduction, And if I leave you with the impression that there are bad people in my life, then I'm sorry, both to you and the people so portrayed. For there are no villains in the story. There is just a ragtag band of hillbillies struggling to find their way. That sounds so nice, but it's so unbiblical. People are not just good people struggling to find their way. We are evil. But you ask, don't people still do good things? Well, the Bible teaches that the goodness we see in unsaved people is just what remains of the image of God, along with God's restraint on their evil disposition. What people don't realize is that if you remove from the unsaved man everything that is on loan from God, and you remove God's restraint, what remains is pure evil. People don't realize what they have is borrowed from God. It's not really their own. The mistake they make is thinking that their goodness is their own, not admitting that there is the seed of evil in their soul. That's what really belongs to them. Now, in this life, the unsaved man may not get around to carrying out every possible evil deed or ideology, but nevertheless, the soul still contains the seed of evil. The soul is still at enmity with God. The soul is still in league with Satan himself. So think of the judgment seat of God as God removing the mask. And when everyone sees what is under the mask, 
nobody is going to doubt the justice of hell. And if in hell, the soul has removed from it all that remains of the good image of God, what's left? See, in order to have regrets, you have to have some love for the good. How can you have regrets if you have no good ambition? And in order to appreciate pain and lostness, you have to first appreciate beauty and unity with God. But remove all of the good image of God from the sinner and what's left? No wonder Jesus described hell as a place where the worm does not die. You say, well, are there worms in hell? No. Jesus is referring to the people there. They exist, but there's some sort of evolution downward. Once God removes his image from these people, they're like worms. And, you know, we see this on earth in nursing homes and in psych wards where patients are alive, but they're oblivious to their sedentary lives. Now, in Luke chapter 16, Jesus gives the story of the rich man in Hades. And we find that the rich man is there, and he has a personal concern for his own well-being. He asks for a drop of water, and he has concern for his five brothers. Luke chapter 16, verse 28, Send Lazarus to warn my five brothers so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Now, some Bible teachers question the rich man's motives here. But even in hell, he seems to show a degree of love, a degree of sympathy. How could this be? Well, without going into much exposition here, the rich man is in a place of departed spirits before the great white throne judgment. But at the end of the world, after the great white throne judgment, Hades will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, And more than one commentator has pointed out the further deterioration that will take place in the lake of fire. Well, that's all we have time for. Let me conclude with a thought from C.S. Lewis about hell. Quote, heaven is this ever increasing, further up, further into joy, into God, into life. Hell is the opposite of that. It is an everlasting movement away from God. Unquote. And we need to realize that that movement away from God begins here on earth. Right now, you're either on the highway to heaven or you're on the highway to hell. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 8. A highway will be there, a roadway, and it will be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not travel on it, but it will be for him who walks that way. And fools will not wander on it. Also in his book, The Problem of Pain, C.S. Lewis says about those who argue against the doctrine of hell, there's a choice. Quote, In the long run, the answer to those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out your past sins and at all costs to give you a fresh start, smoothing every difficulty and offering every miraculous help but he has done so on Calvary. Or are you asking God to just leave you alone? Alas, I'm afraid that is what he will do for you. The damned are, in one sense, successful rebels at the end. They get what they want. The doors of hell are locked on the inside. They enjoy forever the horrible freedom they have demanded and are therefore enslaved. You know what's really scary about hell? It's not when some country preacher preaches a hellfire and brimstone message about hell. What's really scary is when someone makes a rational, authoritative argument for the reality of hell. Because then you have to consider. It may be true. I may be more evil than I could even imagine. So I need to run to Christ for salvation. And I hope you do. As always, thank you for making God and Country a part of your discipleship in the Word. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, uh, leave comments below. May God bring you safely into his eternal kingdom. May God bless.